Thanks everyone. I am welcome, welcoming you all to our seminar on uh, understanding informal models of septic tank emptying services. Uh, we have case studies from four cities and I'll briefly just take you through what we'll be doing today and then I'll hand over to the presenters. So uh, first we'll have Tarun who has carried out, who has done case, you know, business case studies of, uh, of septic tank emptying operations in Dehradun, Jaipur and Bhubaneswar. And he's, you know, looked at the business models, looked at what those people are doing, what they're charging, the, you know, the, the, the business arrangements of these septic tank emptying services in these three cities. So he's going to talk about his findings from his case studies. After this, we will have uh, Shweta and Marie Ellen. They have done a, um, a kind of, you know, using a different, a different methodology and a different approach. They have gone to septic tank operators in two locations in Delhi and done a you know, more in-depth localized study about the, about the business models and about the conditions and the, the market conditions and the regulatory conditions in which these operators function. And finally, we have Tarun and, I'm sorry, Prashant and Anandita, who will, who have drawn from all of these four case studies, plus from, am I not audible? Yeah. Uh, then we have Prashant, uh, Prashant and Anandita, who have drawn from these four case studies, and also from recent field visits to Narsapur and Varangal, and uh, developed some business models, uh, developed some sort of models of how the, you know, of these businesses to understand these businesses in economic terms and what happens to these businesses if certain kinds of regulatory conditions or other market conditions are changed to help us understand what happens when, I mean, you know, the, the current condition we have is that all these operators are completely informal, but what happens if some aspects of this service is formalized, uh, you know, so to project what the impact on these operators might be. So with that, I'll hand over now and Tarun first. Uh, we won't take any questions just in the interest of time and getting through this program. We won't take any questions during the presentations, but there'll be a lot of time after, so hold on to your questions, and we will have, you know, questions and answers after all three pre presentations are over. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Arkcha mentioned, that uh, I'll be presenting brief findings and insights from uh, three cities, Dehradun, Jaipur, and Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, to quickly run through the outline of the study, as in I'll set the context and then the approach methodology that I adopted for identifying the findings. The business model, more like business process that uh, these operators uh, uh, take. The FSM process, the service value delivery process. Then the learnings from the business processes and the brief about the way forward that how these findings can help in say, creating the policy and regulatory mechanisms. Uh, objective was to draw out lessons from the provision of fecal sludge management in three specified cities. And there are three diverse cities. As you can see that, one, they are all three capital cities of different sizes. Um, in terms of septic tank penetration or sewer, tank, uh, sewer, sewer, sewer connection, they are also diverse in terms of, Dehradun has a very high septic tank penetration uh, with 80% and Jaipur is mostly sewer and 10%. Uh, okay. And Bhubaneswar is... Uh, uh, half seaward and half uh, septic tank. Uh, in terms of policy landscape also, uh, Dehradun doesn't have any FSM regulation or policy in place as of now, which is Uttarakhand, the state of Uttarakhand doesn't have. They were talking about it. Uh, Jaipur came out uh, recently with a FSM policy, which was mostly uh, designed on the outlines of the uh, Government of India's uh, FSM policy. And Bhuvaneshwar has a history of guidelines and regulations for both at the state level and now even at the municipal corporation level. Um, the approach was initially a desk research and inception based study, uh, identifying, we went to Dehradun for the first time to identify the landscape, that what would be the way to gather this information because it's mostly informal sector. Uh, the key within the cities to identify where these people are located and how do they operate from where the, wherever they are. Then we met these FM service providers, we uh, talked about four or five in each city. Uh, and they are very busy, so it's difficult to catch them, but it was, again, either at the place where they were located or while they were conducting their operations. Then we identified elements of business operations and then consolidated findings. Uh, in terms of the processes, it's these are the building blocks, activities, customer segments, and uh, cost and revenue, of course. Uh, mostly it's a profitable business model, and it's private sector operation in all the three cities, but in Jaipur, 
there are three municipal uh, trucks which operate, uh, uh, which which exist but they don't operate. In Bhuvaneshwar, there were three uh, trucks which were operating and six uh, new ones were recently purchased. This is the broad service delivery cycle, which I'm sure you will see uh, in the coming presentation also. But this is the broad uh, uh, process that uh, gets followed when a septic tank gets full. The client approaches the service provider, mostly through phone or in person. Then the service provider approaches uh, with a tractor truck. In the Aradun's case, uh, sometimes because the topography is very difficult, uh, they send somebody with a bike to identify whether the, tra whether the tractor will reach or not. Then there would be a verbal agreement uh, on the phone, and uh, uh, once the agreement is uh, on, on terms of the pricing, then the service provider will connect the tank to the septic tank, uh, empty the septic tank, and then transport the sludge and dispose it. And this disposal is different in all the three cities as well. In the Haradun, they were <coughs> disposing it in a train which was linked to a STP. In Jaipur, it was in a Nala, which is a, a defunct river. And in Bhuvaneshwar, it were, there were multiple open drains and nalas where they were uh, disposing it. <clears throat> in terms of activities, uh, I'll talk brief, briefly about the value chain uh, in the next slide. But it is not integrated in the sense that in most, in all the three cities, uh, it is only the concept, it's only the process of emptying and disposal that is carried out by, by these service providers. So it is not integrated into the beginning, which is putting or installing septic tanks or toilets, or towards the end, which is recycling and reuse of the sludge. Um, it is, the technology is used mainly for uh, emptying of sludge, which is rudimentary technologies, and there is big potential of better technology. And in terms of activity, carrying out the activity, the work times are mostly during a normal working day from 8 to 8. Uh, a lot of times uh, it is the morning hours, which uh, where they, these people get called a lot because the head of the household is there. In Bhuvaneshwar, uh, because the labor stays quite far away from uh, the city, so that's why most of the operators wind up their uh, operations by 6 uh, p.m. because they have to go far, far away. Customer segments in most, in all the three cities, these are the broad categories, households, institutions, as in, in terms of household, it's single houses and housing colonies and informal housing. In Jaipur, it's mostly informal housing, uh, which is not connected to the sewer and the bigger uh, client share is in terms of these uh, informal housing. In Jaipur, again, wedding halls and gardens was a separate uh, category uh, because it has a lot of uh, uh, these uh, temporary uh, wedding halls outside the limits of the city which are not connected to the sewer. So this is a customer segment which is specifically in case of uh, Jaipur. And in Dehradun it was also because it's the administrative capital and most of the places, even government buildings are not connected. So government buildings are also clients. But there is no significant customer differentiation in all the cities between high or low income clients in terms of, say, approaching these clients or maintaining a relationship. In some of the uh, cities, like in Dehradun, they did mention that there are long-term arrangements, but it's still mostly informal. Value proposition, as I talked about, then it is mostly the emptying and transport as of now and disposal, no to use. And uh, the service providers don't uh, engage in any of the cities in provision of toilet septic tanks or treatment or processing. In Dehradun, they even mentioned that sometimes they uh, dispose it in jungles, uh, in uh, uh, in Jaipur and Bhuvaneshwar, any open drains or sewer drains, but mostly there are a few specific spots in e each of these cities where they are disposing it. So there is a potential of extending the value chain. The service providers are aware more in Bhuvaneshwar and Jaipur than Dehradun, where they, are, they know that there are benefits of recycling the sludge, and there can be processes which can extend this value chain. Uh, in I'm just quickly running to resources part because that is essential that uh, to manifest this value proposition they need uh, resources and it's in all the three cities again human resources, uh, physical technological resources and financial resources. Uh, it is uh, in uh, De Dehradun and Jaipur uh, it was one driver and one labor. In Bhuvaneshwar it was one driver and two helpers. Um, in J Dehradun and Jaipur, again, it was tractors that they were using to transport the sludge. In Bhuvaneshwar, it was a tank, uh, it was a truck, and mostly they are second-hand tractors or trucks. They all have uh, varying tanks which they installed uh, 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 behind these trucks and tractors, between 3,000 to 5,000 liters. These capacities are different. In Dehradun, it's 5,000 liters. In uh, Jaipur, it was around 3,000 liters. And in uh, Bhuvaneshwar, it's about 4,500 to 4,000 liters. They all use a pipe and a vacuum, which is a rudimentary technology, again, to create suction. They are locally fabricated and assembled in all the places in Jaipur. It, is, it comes out from Faridabad and Dehradun from Hapur and Bhuvaneshwar near Puri and other places. 
they don't use any protective gear there was no evidence they do, they know that it is essential they did mention they have it but it was not there of course there is no use of navigation devices also in bhubaneswar they are talking about managing it through a regulation but they, nobody is using it in terms of financial it is friends and family savings it's their own capital that they invest uh, they take farm loans and more in uh, again bhubaneswar and jaipur and dehradun uh, because uh, it is again agricultural loan as in take they buy tractors it's only for vehicles not for the uh, uh, not for the tanks it's taken as an agricultural loan and they mentioned that because of this it is difficult for ex- for them to expand uh in terms of channels which is essentially a process of maintaining communication and advertising between the clients and the customer the main channel of advertising is uh, word of mouth uh they have uh, they don't consider formal advertising like print or tv ads uh, on local channels or news ads as a very credible way of expanding their market presence in dehradun for example they said that there is a lot of stigma attached so they wouldn't prefer to put it on a tv or on a cable tv when people are eating food they wouldn't like it though they said that people have tried to uh, market through putting it on a service tray, uh, on a key ring and others in bhubaneswar one of the service providers said that uh, some of the bigger service providers have engaged in providing tickers on cable tv channels as well but the upshot is that it is word of mouth through which people communicate about their businesses they do use visiting cards they print they keep a small budget for visiting cards in which they which they carry on person when they are moving around doing their operations and in all the three cities they do that they in all the three cities they have a different color for painting their uh, tankers so in dehradun it is blue tankers in uh, jaipur it is pink tankers and in uh, bhubaneswar they are yellow tankers and they very prominently put the phone numbers of the uh, service provider on the tanker so whenever they are passing through the various parts of the city people are able to again this is another way of uh, communicating about their work uh, they yeah, but yeah by expanding their formal channels they might have a better market presence Uh, in terms of relationship again it is mostly one to one relationship between customer and client there is no uh, there is no uh, investment done in terms of maintaining a client base or maintaining a client relationship with these people uh, for institutional clients as i said that in the hradun they did mention they try to make an extra effort to be able to uh, hold on to the clients but one thing that they say is vyavhar or good conduct or uh, better conduct when they are dealing with the clients as a way of retaining clients but other than that there is no effort done in terms of uh, maintaining a client relationship they do have annual maintenance contract but uh, no copy that we could see which uh, which they said that it's mostly on uh, based on words word of mouth it is not written or uh, uh, authenticated in terms of cost heads again as in, in all the cities there are fixed cost heads tractor truck uh, tractor for jaipur and dehradun truck for bhubaneswar tank and a suction motor pipe and tires they again have 100 to 200 feet uh, tanks in dehradun they have longer uh, pipes because the terrain is uh, such uh, tires again as in they have to buy tires for uh, they again buy second hand tires uh, and as the wear and tear of tires is quite high in terms of operational cost heads there are salaries and maintenance and fuel for the drivers and the helpers and maintenance of the engine and fuel for day to day running and again they use second hand trucks or tractors and financing through uh, family savings these are broad numbers again uh, for dehradun jaipur and bhubaneswar as and they are for tractor and truck it is again between 6 to 7 lakhs for tank and motor uh, they mentioned in dehradun and jaipur's case that there is a separate cost for tanks and tires and tank and the motor comes installed with the tank when they are buying it in bhubaneswar they said that the 7 lakh actually includes all the cost of the tank and the motor driver wages are again around some sometimes they mention per day sometimes they mention per month but it is about 400 per day in dehradun 12000 per month in uh, jaipur and again around 12000 in bhubaneswar helper wages are a little low and sometimes these wages per day uh, do include a 50 rupee allowance for transport and 50 rupee allowance for food so this is what capture what is captured and it is again an average value for four or five operators it is not a scientifically calculated value the fuel again is about 500 to 1000 rupees per day or 12000 rupees per day to 11000 per month i think there is a uh, this is per day not month in bhubaneswar's case uh, and they mostly calculate in all places based on the number of trips they make in a day so they don't have a mileage they only have they only calculate in terms of how many trips they are able to complete once they fill their tank fully then revenue again fees fees are charged for emptying is the only revenue that's the only way they are making revenue uh, that they charge 
uh, the charges are on per trip basis so multiple trips might give you a lower uh, revenue or might give you a lower fee but mostly if you have to make multiple trips for the same septic tank it will be per trip uh, these charges get affected by season but distant accessibility so if from where these people are standing if they have to go far away then they charge higher prices in dehradun they stand uh, right in the city center at area called lalpul which is in the middle of the city so from there the distances are equally uh, distributed in most of the places in jaipur they stand on the fringe of the city in bhubaneswar again they are in multiple locations so uh, distance from where they are operating impacts the pricing the accessibility to tank in dehradun again because some of the houses are inside uh, lanes it is difficult to access them so uh, that impacts the pricing all payments are in cash in all the cities there are no written accounts uh, there are no designated or controlled prices and the laying of sewer lines is something that they say that might impact their revenues and you can see that in dehradun there this is again average trip based on these four or five interviews around four trips seven trips and 7.25 trips in bhubaneswar and the pricing is again 1500 to 675 to 950 in uh, all the three cities and again there is no formal interaction between sps and the urban local bodies uh, in dehradun people were not aware that there is a, uh, that people are talking about coming out with fsml regulation in jaipur's case even the fsm policy was out the municipal corporation was not aware that the policy is out in bhubaneswar i think the state level department and the urban local body have been talking very closely to come out with this regulation and the state uh, the city level guidelines are uh, actually being used by the state to formulate these guidelines um, the technology partnerships are mostly ad hoc and they are not long term so these partnerships uh, in all the three cities again are about uh, either uh, where they can get repaired where they can get their tractors or trucks repaired or where they can uh, fill their tankers with fuel uh, or when they have to uh, purchase equipment or uh, there are these informal brokers the plumbers and sweepers uh, in bhubaneswar's case it is plumbers where they do a lot of uh, marketing for uh, these service providers very briefly about the way forward in terms of uh, how some of these business processes if they are streamlined can uh, ensure uh, better revenues or better operations uh, i think if the working conditions in these cities are professionalized if they are wearing uniforms or if there are formal training that is provided and a lot of it came out of the interviews in these places was that if they are given orientation that a lot more in dehradun because uh, the septic tank coverage is quite high and they have a lot of work to do uh they they did talk about orientation to formal guidelines if there are new rules and regulations that are coming out of those trainings are given better administration they said that they are maintaining their business, maintaining their accounts and managing the business very ad hoc so there is training about uh, managing the business better in a better way about safety uh, safety training and operating machinery and technology in a better way uh, also in terms of outreach there are still segments which are not uh, covered very well in bhubaneswar it was very specifically pointed out that these tractors and these trucks are not able to reach so they are piloting uh, using spawner uh, tankers which are which are able to go into inaccessible lanes as well and awareness of builders and technology versus cost again which is if there is a higher technology implication then it impacts the cost uh, key areas where government can add value in private sector provision without uh, having an over regulation which bhubaneswar said uh, was uh, pertinent was creating standards for emptying and disposal uh, providing appropriate infrastructure for disposal and treatment even though they know that uh, they don't have that there can be better ways of disposal but because there is no uh, existing facilities they end up disposing it in an unsafe manner providing ex- cheaper access to finance not only for vehicles but also for uh, uh, yeah, machinery and also creating city level strategies because all these three cities provided very specific uh, uh, scenarios so strategies for uh, Uh, providing fsm regulation can also be tailored to the needs of the city and the final point need to build on relationship between local body state government and the private sector thank you we'll move now directly to shweta and marielen yeah uh, i will just take two minutes to introduce uh, because uh, it's really shweta's work that is going to be presented this is a uh, as you've seen outside if you're interested in the detail of the work that we've been working on there is a report has uh, been printed so you can uh, just go back home with it and read it fully um, maybe i just want to say one or two words which is uh, we didn't at all uh, look at this study or decide to do this study thinking in terms of business model 
and we are not even sure that what we want to discuss is business models at all. So this is something what, uh, that needs to be kept in mind. This is a very ethnographic work, and the idea was to try to understand what is happening in areas where there is no sugar. And um, as uh, a lot of things you will see are similar to what Tarun found out in terms of the organization of small-scale providers, which is also <coughs> similar to things you see in other countries in Southeast Asia or even in Africa, African countries. So there's a lot of similarities in the organization of the sector. And uh, I think what we want to raise mostly, which we feel is important for this discussion, and Shweta will uh, come back to it again and again in the presentation, is that if ever we use this term business model and we try to think of how these informal uh, operators could play a role in the provision of a public good, and I insist on the idea that they are not in partnership, it, this is really the idea of how you provide a public good for the city. It means to go much beyond simply understanding, okay, the cost and the, and the revenues and how they operate, but to try to understand in which kind of local context and social context they are anchored. And, okay. yeah. Thank you, Marie. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shweta, and I am an RA with the urban sanitation team here at uh, CPR. And today I will be discussing how two informal septic tank emptying markets operate in Delhi using an uh, in-depth case study. So uh, just to brief you, then uh, the presentation has been divided into four parts. I will be starting with how these uh, how this informal small-scale leafletting service emerged in these settlements. And uh, very shortly, I will also be introducing you these settlements. And in section two, I will be introducing the <coughs> entrepreneurs and will be talking more about their social and economic backgrounds. And at the same time, throughout the presentation, I will be drawing out the similarities and dissimilarities between both the two markets that we have studied. And in the third section, I will be talking about the organization of the defludging business in the two markets. Which, uh, in which I will be talking about how this, uh, this particular sector operates and its functions. And uh, in the fourth section, I will very briefly talk about the financial characteristics of the business, talking about the prof profits and the revenue. And uh, lastly, I will conclude uh, by flagging some points concerning the existing business uh, models in place. So uh, just to give you an overview of the methodology that we adopted, then. Uh, uh, we used uh, semi-qualitative studies, and these were conducted in two neighborhoods of Delhi. Both the neighborhoods were unsewered, and this includes the neighborhood of Krishan Bihar, which is in North Delhi, and uh, Ayanagar, which is in South Delhi. And both the settlements are slightly similar in characteristics because uh, they have a similar population range. So Ayanagar has a population of 33,000, whereas Krishna Bihar has a population of 40,000. And uh, septic tank coverage is very high in both the settlements. Ayanagar has a coverage of about 94% of all the individual household toilets, whereas we estimate it to be the same, probably the same in Krishna Vihar as well. And uh, both these settlements are serviced by a very small uh, group of entrepreneurs uh, who, who are very, very localized in terms of their operation. So in Ayanagar, we have 12 operators who are <coughs> available, and in Krishna Vihar, uh, we have nine. So in total, uh, out of the 21, we managed to interview 18 of these operators. And uh, all of the 18 entrepreneurs were interviewed using in-depth questionnaires. And also this, uh, this particular questionnaire talked about a broad range of questions. We asked them about their family backgrounds, their economic and social backgrounds, as well as the function of the business and their own views and perspectives uh, on, the, on the activity that they work in. So coming to uh, the emergence of this, or probably I'd say the demand for this particular service, I would first like to talk about how these settlements emerged. So uh, there, both these settlements have very similar stories. So in Ayanagar, uh, both Ayanagar and Krishna Vihar emerged in the mid-1980s due to a growing demand for affordable housing. And both the settlements are unsewered and are categorized as unauthorized colonies. So uh, what's special about these two settlements is that uh, they emerged from or carved from uh, urban villages, which were back then rural. So Ayanagar colony emerged from the Ayanagar village, which is a Gujar-dominated village in South Delhi, whereas Krishna Vihar emerged from the Put Kalan village, which is, a dominated, which is dominated by the Jats. And other than Krishna Vihar, uh, Put Kalan also gave rise to settlements such as Budvihar and Mangiram Park. So informal desludging service 
actually arrive in the settlement uh, in the around the same time in both the settlements. <coughs> so in Ayanagar, it emerged in the early two uh, early 2000s. In Krishna Vihar, it emerged in late 1990s. And also, uh, uh, we think that this particular 15-year uh, gap was because uh, the settlements hadn't attained a certain population for these mechanized desludging service to be in recurrent demand. So during this period, uh, septic tanks were emptied by manual scavengers, or uh, otherwise the septic tanks were constructed such that the septage would leach into the ground. And uh, what is similar about both the sites is that uh, desludging service was first introduced by the villagers of the respective uh, villages. So in Ayanagar village, uh, uh, villagers, the Jata villagers, were the first ones to provide this service, whereas in uh, Putkalan, it were the Jat villagers. So this brings me to the second section of my presentation, where I will talk more about their social and economic backgrounds. So in both the markets, uh, these markets were a mix of entrepreneurs from the urban villages and the neighboring unauthorized colonies. So in Ayanagar, there were five entrepreneurs from Ayanagar village and uh, two from the colony, whereas two from the neighbor, uh, neighboring settlement of Jonapur. Whereas in Krishna Vihar, we had two from Putkalan village and uh, two from Krishna Vihar. All two of them were uh, both uh, entrepreneurs from both these settlements are Jats, and uh, we have four entrepreneurs from Bud Vihar. These are both, uh, these four entrepreneurs were migrants. And uh, concerning the caste backgrounds, then both the markets were a mix of general OBC and SC categories. So in Ayanagar, we had five uh, Jatas, two <coughs> OBC Gujars, and uh, uh, one OBC. And otherwise, what is special about this particular sector that uh, we had, uh, we even had one Brahmin entrepreneur in this market. And in Krishna Vihar, it was uh, primarily the Jata entrepreneurs, followed by three OBC uh, entrepreneurs and one ja uh, Jata entrepreneur. And uh, in both these markets, uh, all the entrepreneurs had attained very uh, low educational qualification, and only one entrepreneur, the Brahmin entrepreneur I just mentioned, had uh, uh, acquired his college degree. Now, talking about the economic characteristics, then uh, all these entrepreneurs, before entering uh, into the desludging market, had engaged in small-scale activities. These activities included provision of cab service, retail of animal fodder, dairy production and vegetable vending and so on. And uh, at the same time, as of now, the entrepreneurs also engage in alternate activities as a supplementary source of income. So these activities include retail of animal fodder, property rental and tent house and so on. And uh, in Ayanagar, in fact, one, uh, three entrepreneurs also considered their participation in these sludging activity only a part-time activity. And uh, in the case of Krishna Vihar, similar was the case, but uh, uh, there were many who considered uh, the particular activity a primary source of income, and interestingly, there was one entrepreneur who was employed with the Delhi police. Uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the Delhi traffic police. So uh, at night he would work as a constable, and during the day he would uh, uh, run his uh, desludging business. So what uh, uh, what is a very special feature about this particular sector is that uh, uh, social networks play a very crucial role. So we found that a lot of these entrepreneurs were introduced into the sector by their friends and family members who were already part, in this, part of this sector. And uh, these friends and family members also provided some kind of a support concerning uh, investment into the, into the business. So they provided uh, these uh, new entrants into the market with uh, informal loans as well as information concerning business setup. And, uh, but mostly, all in all, I, I would say that friends and family members were primarily the source of finance. To talk more about the relevance of social networks in this sector, I would uh, like to take your attention to the figures uh, in this particular slide. So we found that uh, uh, in Ayanagar, all of the entrepreneurs were uh, known to each other, and uh, they shared a very strong relationship with one another. They were either friends with each, friends with each other or uh, were known to each other through familial ties. And uh, all of them, uh, the entrepreneurs, had colluded together to form some sort of an organization uh, what they would call an association to operationalize or uh, uh, regulate or manage their business as a single unit. So this particular collective had a very strong relationship of trust between the entrepreneurs. However, in Krishna Vihar, we see that uh, although uh, there were social networks <coughs> existent between uh, the entrepreneurs, this market was divided into two groups. So uh, one group comp uh, comprised of the Jat entrepreneurs, whereas the other group comprised of 
the uh, migrants from Buddh Vihar. And also, uh, there was complete lack of trust between these entrepreneurs, because of which uh, we will now see how uh, the operations of desludging uh, actually differed in both the markets. So I will first be taking up the case of uh, Ayanagar, uh, where I just mentioned that it was uh, regulated by a collective. So this particular reg uh, collective was uh, formed in September 2016 to actually check competition. So uh, before this organization was made, uh, the tariffs were severely low and uh, the entrepreneurs would be in constant competition with one another. So in order to hike the tariffs, uh, this uh, collective was formed. And after its formation, the tariffs were hiked to 650 to, uh, 650 to 700 per trip. And also, after, uh, after formation of this collective, the activity became highly territorialized. So uh, they would check against entry of non-member uh, entrepreneurs from the neighboring districts into their settlement. So uh, in the map, uh, in this particular slide, you can see that all the yellow areas are the, uh, a part of the territory of this particular collective. And within the collective, and within the spatial uh, territory, the rules uh, of the collective apply. So uh, what the collective does is that uh, the work is distributed equally among the uh, entrepreneurs. So, uh, so all the calls or customer calls are directed to their headquarters, which is uh, a community land that they operate out of. And then it is delegated one by one to every entrepreneur. And also this particular collective uh, encourages reciprocity between them. So in case uh, an entrepreneur is falling short of a pipe, then they can probably ask their colleagues to share it with them. Or in case my labor is absent, I can ask my colleague to, uh, colleague's uh, driver to work for me. At the same time, the collective was also highly criticized by the local leaders who accused the collective of looting the residents. So this was also a concern. Now, uh, now, in a complete contrast, the market in Krishna Vihar was completely fragmented. There was no collective in place, and all the entrepreneurs worked independently. So, uh, if you see, uh, if you see the dots, then those are the settlements that are served by the entrepreneurs. And if you notice that all of them, uh, all of these settlements are to the north of Krishna Vihar, because the settlements to the south are managed by another cartel, who do not allow intruders into their collective. So. Uh, in this uh, particular market, competition is very high and undercutting is also very common. Uh, they charge the residents a fare of 400 to 450 per trip, which can also reduce to 300 when competition is very high. And uh, it seems that uh, for the last 10 years, they have been trying to form a, form a collective, but so far the negotiations have failed due to lack of consensus between the original villagers and the uh, newly entered migrants. So uh, now I will very quickly discuss how these two uh, markets are different in terms of disposal, uh, sludge disposal. So uh, the, the market in Ayanagar, uh, as far as that, as far as sludge disposal there is concerned, then it's completely unregulated. The uh, entrepreneurs dispose sludge either in stormwater drains after paying a monthly bribe to traffic police, or in agricultural land uh, in the neighbor, neighboring settlement of Jonapur. Whereas uh, in Krishan Vihar, we do see some kind of regulation in place because six months ago, the Delhi Jal Board provided the entrepreneurs here with a fecal sludge disposal chamber. So the entrepreneurs can come anytime during the day, whenever they want and dispose uh, sludge here. And they don't pay any cost. And no tipping fee is applicable to this. And uh, other than this, now, uh, when it comes to uh, servicing distant settlements, since there, are, there is no such facility available them, available there. So what they do is uh, they, they'd rather dispose it in the stormwater drains there because it's more cost effective than coming back to this particular site to dispose it again. Now I will very quickly discuss the financial characteristics of this business because uh, it will be taken up uh, by Anandita and uh, Prashant later in depth. But I would like to highlight here that uh, the containers, the septage containers are mostly purchased from Sampla Haryana for about 1.6 lakhs. And the tractors are purchased for about 5 lakhs uh, through bank loans, again from Haryana. And uh, the fuel costs uh, account for 62% of the operational costs. And also we see that the operational costs are fairly similar in both the settlements. And then the labor costs account for 28% of the operational costs. Now to very quickly uh, talk more about the uh, profits, then uh, 
both the settlements uh, generate the same amount of profits. Now, this is because, uh, uh, or perhaps if we see uh, the difference between the two values, then uh, the entrepreneurs in uh, Krishan Vihar service more uh, households in a month compared to uh, the entrepreneurs I, or the entrepreneurs in Ayanagar. However, being that the fares are significantly lower as a result of this, the revenues are lower, hence the profits are lower. Uh, nevertheless, uh, what seems to be the case is that uh, the market in Ayanagar has a break-even period of two years. However, uh, we think that it's going to be a lot more uh, longer in, and prolonged in Krishan Bihar. And uh, the profits in Ayanagar are expected to increase much more once uh, the operators complete their loan cycle. So in Krishan Bihar, most of the entrepreneurs who were single truck, uh, single truck operators, they had recovered their costs. However, in Ayanagar, they were still paying some kind of a monthly installment. Now, I would like to conclude my pre presentation by highlighting some of the perils of such a business model. So, uh, I'd like to raise the concern about collectivization because uh, whereas uh, collective organization ensures faster recovery of on investments, but uh, what happens is that customers lose out on uh, competitive tariffs. So this can come down heavily on um, working class or customers from the poor income groups who don't have any uh, cheaper options available. But then uh, competitive pricing can uh, can be non-lucrative for newer entrepreneurs in uh, markets such as Krishna Vihar because they are unable to recover their costs in a certain period of time. And also, uh, I'd like to flag out that both these markets uh, exploit drivers and helpers who are paid below the minimum uh, standard wage. So uh, the minimum standard wage as of now for unskilled workers seems to be about 13,000. And it seems here they pay only, or they expend only 8,900 on their laborers. And uh, the last reason being that even though the recent policy interventions have been encouraging uh, on-site sanitation systems and uh, regularization of this particular sector, however, what seems to be the case is that the entrepreneurs report that they uh, are often shamed and stigmatized by their friends and family members. So uh, I'd, like just, I'd just like to bring up the case of uh, this entrepreneur named Satendra, who earlier used to uh, provide these sludging service. And he highlighted one of the reasons he quit the sector is because of constant shaming by his friend, who would often say, ki, Ye tatti wali gaadi shuru kar di hai tune. So uh, finally, I would uh, end my presentation by saying that uh, no matter how important a service that these uh, providers uh, impart to urban sanitation, however, we cannot ignore that caste and discrimination still plays a very important role. So any regularization, if it is to come into place in future, then it needs to, it can't overlook these concerns. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shweta. Thanks for that. And now we'll have uh, Anandita and Prashant. Good evening, everyone. Um, so while I completely agree with Mari that, you know, whether a business case out of this needs to be taken out or not, or we have to look at it as a public good, uh, that is debatable, and we can take a stock. But, you know, nobody can provide a service if that person is not on it, uh, unless it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, imparted by government organizations. So uh, we try to see what makes these uh, small-scale enterprises going in the ground to understand what if the regulations to come in, if the treatment facilities to be put in place all across India, then how would the uh, profitability fare in such a situation? Will they drive these small skill providers out? Is that the intention? So we are going to throw up some questions based on the numbers. The numbers are really not what we want to attention to, but definitely they play a role to understand the broader trend that we are going to get out of it. 
So I will just set the context very briefly. Uh, you know, uh, urban sanitation has for long been thought about giving, providing sanitation to 4041 statutory town. Mm, but it's high time that we understand that it's beyond STs and it is beyond census towns as well. Our colleagues in CPR has now come out with a list of 155 villages, excuse me, which has, you know, uh, a clear preference for urban-like infrastructure for their sanitation services. And if that is the case, and the pace at which the SBM urban and Grameen going forward, uh, the penetration of toilets and its associated underground infrastructure is going to be so large that unless you have some arrangements to provide cleaning services for these facilities, it's going to be uh, very critical. So, uh, so, you know, as we move forward, it will be very crucial that we think about providing for these desludging services across much, uh, you know, at a much larger scale than at, at present we are even thinking about it. So just to uh, give a, you know, just to show you how it is that in, where in uh, statutory towns, one third of its population are sewered, they have some kind of network solution. The, the census towns as well as these larger roster villages are actually heavily dependent on on-site sanitation systems. And, uh, and, you know, in days to come, it's not that, you know, tomorrow they will be sewered. Sewer, sewering is itself such a cost intensive activity, hence there is immense need to look at on, you know, decentralized systems to service these on-site sanitation. So I'll take a while to just profile the cities that Tarun and Shweta has undertaken the study on, where we see, you know, the Dehradun and Jaipur has a similar characteristics where both of them are ODF as per uh, SBM. And uh, both of them have a toilet penetration of around more than 94% in the city. However, half in Dehradun and one-fourth in Jaipur are dependent on uh, on-site sanitation systems. And, you know, the Amrut investments that, uh, that they have proposed are mostly towards, uh, uh, you know, extending their sewerage network, not really putting up decentralized systems. But, yes, there are proposals for STPs as well in these cities. In Bhuvaneshwar, uh, the household toilet penetration is uh, lower. It's at 80%, but, you know, a much more, 60% uh, of the populations depend on on-site sanitation systems. And uh, for Delhi, Delhi is, uh, the two locations that we have studied throws a very different picture than what the Delhi itself as a city throws, because uh, Delhi is mostly sewer. Whereas, uh, you know, Ayanagar is 95% households depends on on-site sanitation. So there are these pockets of non seward areas within the uh, within Delhi itself, which throws very different uh, situations to look at. So just to recollect uh, from the, both the past presentations, what are the key points that we take away from uh, the two presentations there? You know, the business is basically thriving because there is some form of horizontal cartelization where people are able to fix their price, allocate the market between themselves, and also, you know, limit the innovation for that matter with regard to the service provision. And also there's very high entry barriers that the collusion is putting. So there is no, uh, you know, to prevent the price war basically, because there is no other mechanisms to account for the price change. And um, often these operators, interestingly, have some uh, significant local political clout that we have found from these studies that... They are these big Dada kind of people within their settlements who are providing, who are part of provision of these services. And non-existence of de designated dumping sites, lack of regulations actually keep the input costs very low. So that is, that is what exactly we try to figure out when we model uh, the business cases. So uh, there are uh, a few risks that these businesses are operating with. The financial risks are mostly they are uh, unable to access institutional credits because of non-formalization and non-licensed activities. And, uh, and anyone who enters the market is able to cut a price. And if, if a price is cut, then there is this market war and then they mitigate by colluding amongst each other. Then, uh, you know, there is no, either the regulations are in place, not informed, nobody knows, and thus the police comes you know, intimidation is very high, which they mitigate then by paying some bribes here and there. 
then uh, you know this access to labor is a is a big concern because you know either they are di- at a distance they have to come up and it's not a sector that everyone wants to associate as uh, shweta has pointed pointed out and uh, then uh, you know from the public health perspective it's indiscriminate disposal leakages and slippages that can happen due to you know poor quality of tankers that are being used and also this unpredictability of the demand nobody knows when the demand will come there can be a day when you have served 14 households and then can be months without any demand so there is this unpredictability where you don't know and that's the price uh, you know accounts for that high unpredictability and being high and obviously the quality of the containment structure is something to be contested so from here we'll uh, i'll hand it over to prashant who will uh, take you through the assumptions and the different business models that we have come up with and then we uh, you know and then we go to the critical questions that these business model throws up thanks anantha so uh, i'm going to try to spend a lot of time on the different business models that we have done i'll be spending most of the time on kind of outlining the different uh, changes across the business models and then i'll take you through the numbers as fast as i can uh but essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to take an average of the revenues and expenditures that were reported across our four case studies and we're trying to examine what are the different shocks that we can introduce on either the cost or the revenue side uh and part of the idea here is that this is against the backdrop of a lot of construction of treatment facilities to like in which these operators are supposed to dump there and there is also a spurt of regulation to formalize this market and part of our question is what kind of cost does this impose on these uh, on these enterprises can they operate in this new environment and if they do are they going to charge a new price which the consumers then have to pay so there are five uh, basic cases one is this base case and this is where there are high barriers to entry like shwapa has described then the treatment facilities are unavailable so there is indiscriminate dumping and there are no kind of licensing or other regulatory costs so they don't have to pay any vehicle taxes they don't have to get commercial registration they of course don't have to get any kind of septic tank emptying fees uh we try to model the the, the revenue and the cost set separately so on the lower hand side you have the low entry barrier model in this one we lower the barriers to entry we assume the entry of a competitor who can charge different prices which will undercut the prevailing price but we stay with the assumption that there are no treatment facilities and that there are no other costs then we go up to the fstp model here or the treatment facility model in general where we stay with the high barriers to entry but we introduce some form of treatment facility where these operators are mandated to dump this will change their costs in ways as we will see in future slides again there are no licensing costs staying with the treatment facility idea we then introduce some some regulatory costs again on the cost side but again there are no changes on the revenue side and finally what we want to do is we want to combine these two models so we combine the idea where you know i mean like new people can enter the market and challenge them on the price but they also have to deal with the higher cost due to the treatment facility and the regulatory cost what does that do to their to their profitability there are two key variables that we want to highlight in our analysis that i'll just describe one is return on investment that's if that's essentially the profits that they make divided by the cost that they are that they are incurring and the other question we want to ask is what is the new price that they charge in each case to to return to a certain roi right so there are two sets of assumptions these are the basic assumptions which hold across all of our business models uh the the most basic is that they have one revenue source that is the fee that they charge to households and institutions to empty their septic tanks uh on the cost side there are capital costs and operating expenses the capital costs are the cost obviously of your tractor or your small trucks the cost of the container that you put that you fit on the back the cost of the of the pump etc and these are an average of the data that we have got from our case studies on the operating side you have your fuel costs your wages your maintenance fees which are functions of the number of trips taken so if you have to go out to a treatment facility then you know these costs might increase if you don't then you know then they might stay the same in the presence of a treatment facility there'll be tipping fees there be registration fees and licensing fees in the regulatory models but i'll introduce each of these costs as we come to the models themselves right mm-hmm. uh, on the number of trips per day we assume that they do four trips a day during the non monsoon season and seven trips during the monsoon seasons the reason for this seasonal variability is that a that this is also the kind of the data that we have got from different studies 
uh, but also in the monsoon season that the, that the rising groundwater, especially in places like Bhubaneswar, will cause the separate tanks to fill up quicker and there's a greater demand for desludging. There's a lot of debate numbers I know, especially around the number of trips. Uh, people, people report trips as low as three, some people report going up to 14 trips a day. And you know, that is dependent on how far they're traveling, on how dense the settlement is. But let's stick with these numbers and then try to see what like conclusions these will throw up. We assume a base price per trip of 950, which will change across the model, <coughs> and a business cycle of six years. Uh, the reason we assume a six year business cycle is in year one, they have to deal with your capital costs. And in the regulated model, they take a loan. And so that loan is paid off over four years. In year five, they have to replace the container because the containers are typically low quality. This is, again, something that we have found out through our case studies. So really, it's only in year six that they begin to operate as like a normal enterprise. So that these are the profits and the prices and the revenues that they might expect to see throughout their life cycle. And finally, we assume an, a fairly inelastic demand curve for desludging. That's because uh, usually people don't desludge unless they absolutely have to, until the separate tank is completely full and you really have no alternative then. On the market entry side, we assume that the new competitor enters at the end of year two in your, in your six-year business model. He can, he can challenge your price by either 25% or 50%. Um, in the unregulated case, there at the end of year three, there will be some form of collusion and cartelization, as we've heard from Shweta. And in that case, the price will go back to the initial levels of 950, but there will be some loss of trips to our single operator market. In the regulatory side, we will have our two treatment facilities, one at a distance of one kilometer, the other at a distance of eight kilometers from the city center. This is kind of reflecting what we've seen in places like Narsapur and Warangal, which is the distances from the city center. We assume, uh, and we try to model something called pooling, right? So this is the idea that when you uh, desludge one house, you may want to desludge another house before you go dump at an FSTP because you don't want to be traveling around with a half empty tank. But there are cases where this is not possible. Where, example, in, in Narsapur and Warangal, they have a GPS like fitted to their trucks and they aren't allowed to stop anywhere after they've desludged. And that is to prevent them dumping indiscriminately. But the, you know, but the side effect of that is that they cannot actually pool their trips. So we model two cases for each, of these, for each of these FSTPs and we say what happens when you pool and what happens when you don't pool. We assume there's no collusion because it's a fully regulated, you know, well overseen market. They have access to the institutional credit market. There is licensing where they have to pay a thousand rupee fee for the license every two years and a tenant deposit of 10,000. That comes from the DJB regulations, which just came out in 2015. And of course, then there are vehicle registrations, like commercial registration, taxes, PUC, etc. Right? So just to start with the models, the base case again is, our, is an average of the numbers that we have seen across our four case studies. It's a fairly simple model. Uh, he starts out in year two, there's a huge loss because he has to take the full capital cost of setting up his enterprise up front, that's the vehicle cost, the container cost, so he's making a loss of 42% of 42 straight up. But in subsequent years, he's able to charge you know, his 950 price, there's no other operator in the market, so he's making a healthy profit of 95%. Now, 95% sounds like a lot, but it should be kept in mind that really it's about six, you know, about six, I mean like six lakhs, 6 lakhs, 6.3 lakhs, so it's not still a huge enterprise, even though they are very profitable. The drop in year five is due to him replacing the container in that year. And these are trends we'll see throughout the models again. Right. So moving quickly to the low entry barrier case, here we lower the barriers to entry at the end of year two, we introduce a new competitor. Again, there's no change in the cost side. No, that's a, that that's not included in the in the model. That's the six lakhs that he's getting. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. So in the low barriers to entry case, sorry, the low barriers to entry case, when there is a competitor who enters the market, he's cutting the price by twenty five percent. His profit goes down, but not by much. Obviously, when the price is challenged by fifty percent it does go down like a little bit more. And this is basically because he's losing households or he's losing trips. He's not really changing the price just yet. But once he's able to collude and get the price back up to his original level, there is an increase in profit again, right? This is just a graphical representation of what you just discussed. So moving to the cost side, now we have an FSTP or treatment facility operational <coughs> in this market and they are mandated dump there. 
there are two main ways that, that this will drive up your cost. One is the tipping fees that you have to pay to the operator of the treatment facility, and the other is your higher fuel cost because you have to go farther and come back. So this is a treatment facility which is operational within one kilometer. Uh, I know there's a lot of numbers here, so I'm just going to try to highlight like some areas that we can look at together. The first is when he, I mean, like when the treatment facility is built and, and there's no pooling allowed. So he has to go to a house, he has to desludge, and then he has to go straight to the FSTP or the treatment facility. Sorry. Then he will make, I mean, like a, I mean, like a reduced profit as compared to the base case. If you introduce pooling, you can see that there's a clear jump in profit there, right? But if he wants to keep, I mean, like his profit level of 95%, and he's not allowed to pool, the, the price that the consumers face has to go up to 1450. Right? If you allow pooling, then that price only goes up to 1,000. So there's a clear efficiency gain on both sides of the equation. I mean, I mean, like both the suppliers and the enterprises when you allow and like activities like pooling. And pooling here, I know we're talking about pooling as a as a pretty like simple response, but it should, but it can be understood as a proxy for some of the like other behaviors that Shweta was talking about, where they engage in either sequential allocation of trips or there's some kind of conversation in between enterprises where they have some efficiency gains. And all of these won't be captured by the regulation. I mean, like by the regulation. In the second case, where the treatment facility is built much farther away, it's clear that the extra distance, and this is really driven by the higher fuel cost, not the higher tipping fees, um, they are basically unprofitable from day one. So if you don't allow pooling in these kinds of, like in these kinds of scenarios, nobody's going to enter the market. But if you do allow pooling, even then, when the treatment facility is built so far away, the kind of prices that these guys are charging just to desludge go up to, I mean, 4,000 in the without pooling case and this 2,300 in the with pooling case. That's still almost two and a half <coughs> times what we're seeing in our base case, right? So I think one of the things we're trying to bring out here is that when you introduce these treatment facilities, a lot of the prices will either be passed on to the consumer or they will have to be borne by the enterprise. And if they're borne by the enterprises, it's clear what happens to their operating profits. This is, again, just what you've gone through, but I think it's a much more starker, stark representation of what happens when you're building a facility here. So, keep it, so staying on this side, we want to introduce some, uh, some more regulatory costs, and this is, the, and, and a lot of this data comes from the kind of regulations that we're seeing in cities around India right now. One thing that I didn't mention, sorry, beforehand is that there is a cost of bribes, which I think Shweta may have reported as well, Right? And, that, and that cost will drop off in this scenario because the idea is that if you have regulations and it's a well-overseen market, then you really shouldn't have to be bribing anyone to do your, like, to do your business. Now, if that is the case, then you will see that there's not that much impact on profitability from this increased oversight and regulation. But if you're still having to pay bribes, which basically means that the, that the regulations are not being enforced very well, then, they will, then they'll be dropping back into unprofitable levels. So... Just to quickly go through it, again, when you have high regulations, they, they charge a higher price of 1090 and 1015, which are not that different from the non-regulated models. So again, the regulations don't actually add that much cost, but pooling d does add a certain level of e efficiency here. The other thing to see here is that when you are basically operating in a formalized market, there's a certain smoothening of costs over years, right? So you see here in this figure especially, in, while he was making a, I mean like a, I mean like a 50% loss in the previous case here has gone up 25%, but also his profit over the next three years has also dropped. Essentially, he's able to distribute his cost, his capital cost over the first four years, and thereby perhaps new players might enter the market. But the other <coughs> question that you're asking then is that when you're in a formal market, these enterprises will have to do some kind of future planning. They have to know that only in year six will they reach their full level of profitability. Now, do these enterprises have that kind of capacity? That's a question we'll have to figure out, right? Again, here, if he wants to charge a higher price of 1425 to reach his 95% level, he will get there. But if he wants to achieve just a 50% level of profitability, he can charge his 1090. But we don't know how that's going to affect the number of trips that he's doing. These are also questions we have to understand. How does a demand curve actually respond to these kinds of shifts? Again, I mean, this is just a repeat of the, of the previous case where when you build a treatment facility really far away, you're basically going to drive these guys out of business. There's really no incentive for them to enter and travel all the way over there and make these kinds of trips because even when they're pooling, then they have to charge prices of over 4,000 or 2,300, whichever you will, within this pooling and not pooling. And, and you know, and like whether they are takers for that kind of business is a whole different question. And do households resort 
to other even more informal ways of dislodging is something we'll have to understand. So finally, in the consolidated model, now that we've basically driven these guys almost to extinction by adding on these treatment facilities and these regulatory costs and all that, we ask what happens if somebody would enter the market, right? Like now somebody wants to get in the market, they see it's formalized, it's licensed, they, would, they, would, they want to come in here. So, and we, do, and we don't consider the, the eight kilometer case or the Warangal case because they're already loss making. So we start with this, uh, and so we start with the one kilometer case and, and instead of starting with the base with the base case of 950, we start with this level of 1425, which they are charging it to retain 95% profitability here. When somebody enters and they and they cut the price by 50%, they're immediately unprofitable. There is no way this guy can stay in business. This operator can, and it happens with both the pooling and the non-pooling cases. So the idea is that even though they may take some behaviors to improve their efficiency, uh, they're already so vulnerable that they can be they, they can be driven out of business very easily. The same thing happens when the price is cut by 25%, just not to the extent that they become unprofitable, but they're still really not that profitable compared to what they're used to. Now, just if you want to look at all of the models together, I think one of the things we have to see is that um, as we move across these, these various iterations, we start with the base case, we introduce a treatment facility, there's pooling, there's not pooling, you know, and then finally you have a, a treatment facility in a regulated market where pooling is possible, the kind of prices that they charge to stay in business vary drastically. Right? They go up as high as 1450 when you have a treatment facility without pooling, they can drop as low as 950 in the base case. The other thing to look at is the kind of profits that these enterprises make over time. Right? In the case where it's a, it's a treatment facility in a regulated market, it's about a, like about a 9 lakh uh, I mean enterprise. And that's, and that's compared to a 6 lakh enterprise in year one in the base case. Does the, does the enterprise have the kind of capacity and, you know, to expand that quickly? Because that's almost a 30, because that's a 50% increase in like almost two years. I mean, do they have that capacity is, a, is, is something we don't know. The case where the, the facility is built even farther away is even more drastic, or is even more drastic. To stay in business in this, they have to, go, they have to basically become, I mean, a 27 lakh enterprise from being a, I mean, like from being a 6 lakh enterprise in the base case. So, the, the kind of burdens that we're placing on these on these enterprises by regulating them and asking them to dump in these streams are not fully understood. So hopefully this puts some numbers on where we're going. So just to conclude on uh, what uh, Prashant has uh, put up on his slide, is not that we are saying that you know you don't build an FSCP or you don't regulate. That's not the idea. The idea is you know with this. Um, NFSSM policy, the national policy for fecal sludge and septage management, which is already uh, released by the government of India and also been adopted by these states like Rajasthan, Delhi, all of them have got their own policies now and many other states have already placed their own policy. The, the question that we want to ask that is it, a, a, if the regulations are driven by public good perspective, is it at the expense of these small scale enterprises? Can we not do something to also make them partner in this you know, delivery of service. Uh, is it not profitable for the customers to have both government and private providing for the services that I can opt for which service I want to go for, uh, you know, rather than one substituting the other completely? And uh, so uh, another question that we want to actually see is that, you know, would the desired situation, uh, how to make this more inclusive, basically? That's the question that we want to ask uh, now. Is can we make the pricing a function of the plot size, or you know, use the plot size as a proxy for the economic situation of people to to have a dynamic pricing system to to make it more economically viable, or you know, what what can decrease the cost? Is is Uberization of these desludging services would be able to stabilize the price? <coughs> across the market and protect people, you know, protect for new entries. Huh? And uh, so the final question that actually we want to ask is, uh, should the regulations come in at one go? Like, is it tomorrow morning when we wake up, all the regulations should be in place? Or is it the incrementality of it that would take the, you know, that would equip the service providers to be able to fun still function in the market in, in the given scenario? 